All right, I think everyone's got their food. We're going to get started here. So thank you all for coming today. I know there's about, as I was put on posters, I saw there's literally like 30 other events going on this afternoon. So thanks for showing up. Um, so Angela Harris is the Distinguished Professor of Law, Buchiever and Bird Endowed Chair for the Study and Teaching of Freedom of Equality, and Director of the Aoki Center for Critical Race and Nation Studies at the UC Davis School of Law. She writes widely in the field of critical legal theory, examining how, sometime, how law sometimes reinforces and sometimes challenges subordination on the basis of race, gender, sexuality, class, and other dimensions of power and identity. I first met Professor Harris back in 1991 uh, at Bolt uh, School of Law when she did recently joined the faculty and was already a rising star there. In 2009, Professor Harris published an article entitled, Should People of Color Support Animal Rights? And that was published in the Journal of Animal Law, and that will sort of serve as a starting point for today's conversation with Professor Kristen Still. Uh, Professor Still is the faculty director of the Animal Law and Policy Program here at Harvard, and also is the director of the Islamic Legal Studies Program, Law and Social Change. So I think uh, Professor Harris is going to speak first, and then the two of them will engage in conversation, and I'll hand it over to the two of them now. And we'll have time afterwards for some questions as well. Thanks so much for coming. Um, can you hear me? I know I'm supposed to be uh, recorded here. So I want to thank Chris and Kelly and Kristen for being here as well and bringing, making it possible for, to be, for me to be here. And uh, I'm, I don't consider myself an animal rights person per se because I don't teach that class. Um, I think of myself as a critical race feminist who's interested in animal studies uh, because of its fit with an anti-subordination perspective. So that's kind of the basis of my, uh, my remarks today. And um, as Chris mentioned, some years ago, I wrote this essay called Should People of Color Support Animal Rights? And in it, I was criticizing a PETA campaign in which they visually rhymed pictures of gorillas and other animals in captivity with pictures of black people in chains. And the idea behind the campaign was that our society has realized that enslaving black people is wrong, and now we need to take the next step and stop enslaving non-human animals. So my point in that essay was not to hate on PETA in particular, uh, which does some great work, uh, rather to, to use that campaign as an example of a very familiar and well-used liberal narrative uh, a similar narrative, by the way, that has been used and also drawn criticism in the context of LGBT rights. Um, and it, it breaks down as using the template of black civil rights to argue for other kinds of rights. So animals are the new black, gays are the new black. You wouldn't do this to black people, so we shouldn't do it to insert your group here. Um, and in my essay, I tried to explain why this narrative tends to divide rather than unite. In the PETA example, the argument is that the campaign simultaneously managed to compare apes to black people, visually invoking a racist slur, and to tell a story that assumed that the civil rights campaign of black people was a success, uh, which if you're paying attention to Black Lives Matter is clearly not the case. Um, another aspect of this liberal story of animal rights, which I argue is inherently unappealing to people of color, has been its implicitly colonial narrative. And by that, I mean that it calls on the missionary story in which we save others who are cute, helpless, innocent, and or less fortunate than ourselves. Um, and this is not an immoral story, but it's ethically problematic. It's a story that, for example, historically has given white privileged women agency to travel and to exercise power because it implicitly calls on a gendered logic of care. It's a story, for example, that had particular effect in the Victorian era, allowing white colonial women to participate in imperialism through missions of charity. And it comes back in the US progressive era in the settlement movement in immigrant communities and in the various eras of Native American assimilation projects. Um, and the problematic nature of these movements is in its lack of attention to the dynamics of power. So the campaign to save others involves the implicit assumption 
that you, your world, and your way of doing things is the most advanced, and that you yourself are innocent of power, altruistic, and good. Um, so today I want to just um, talk, break down that argument a little more um, by suggesting that this liberal narrative um, is composed both of an ontology, a way of thinking about beings and subjects, um, and a practice that uses the dividing line between us and them, human and non-human, as a justification for social projects of extermination, exploitation, and marginalization of both human and non-human entities. Um, and to talk about the ontology of liberalism, I want to use a couple of, of scenes from the movie Get Out, which if you haven't seen yes. it, it's brilliant, you should go see it. <laughs> um, I'll try not, there's a little bit of spoiler, but not a major spoiler. So if, if you haven't seen it, um, don't worry. Um, so the premise of the movie, if you don't already know, is that the hero is a black man who is dating a white woman, and he's agreed to spend a weekend in the country to meet her family. And he asks her, do they know I'm black? And she says, no, but don't worry, because they're good liberals, and her dad would have voted for Obama for a third term if he could have. But it's a horror movie, so everything goes wrong from there. And very early in the movie, there's an interesting scene where the couple, they're driving along, they're in the middle of the country, they're going to her parents' house. Something hits the car, and it's the first kind of jump scare of the movie. Um, they stop and they get out and they see what, to see what happened. And at first you don't see anything, but you hear this weird moaning. And the girlfriend doesn't want him to investigate, but the hero, of course, because it's a horror movie, gets out to see what's going on. Um, and it turns out that they hit a deer. And there's a point of view shot where we're looking at the dying deer from the perspective of the hero who feels sorry for it, but he's helpless to do anything about it, helpless to save it. And then the story moves on, and we're at the parents' house, this big secluded mansion. The hero meets the parents. It's all fine. They tell the parents about the deer. And the father goes on this rant about how he's glad they killed it, because deer are overrunning the area like a plague. One more dead deer is a good thing. If they killed them all, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't matter to him at all. He wishes they would all be wiped out. And on its surface, this scene doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the movie other than to make the audience feel uneasy. But in terms of the deep structure of the film's argument, it makes perfect sense. Because what underlies this contempt for a non-human species, and what turns out to be a deep anti-black racism, is a will to power that turns all beings other than the privileged group into objects to be exploited at will. And it's a will to power that's based on a set of beliefs about biological truth expressed in the view that some bodies are naturally different in certain ways than others. And this belief in biological difference then justifies and legitimates the will to power held by the master group, the master race. And that's what I think of as the ontology of humanism that underlies the liberal narrative that I'm criticizing. When this ontology is employed within the human species, it cashes out as classical racism. Some groups of humans are naturally different from others. One version of this is Nazi eugenics, which imagines master races and slave races. Another version is supposedly less toxic. It's the David Duke version, which claims that it's not a matter of better or worse, it's just difference. Different races, different civilizations can never assimilate. They have to pursue their separate evolutionary paths or disaster will ensue. But of course, the difference only version is unstable because as soon as one imagines any conflict or any scarcity, um, then it becomes us versus them and it collapses back into those who have the power, get the will to, and the ability to rule others. When this same ontology is employed outside the human species, it cashes out as enlightenment philosophy. Humans are special, different from all other species, placed by God above the rest of nature, and it's part of our unique destiny to exercise dominion over everything that isn't human. We can see the close kinship between classical racism and this philosophy of dominion through the way in which we prepare ourselves to torture, slaughter, and exploit other humans by, quote, dehumanizing them, making them symbolically, rhetorically, into animals. 
Um, and there are a number of philosophical writings that kind of explore the origin of this ontology and find it uh, in, the, in the Enlightenment. The takeaway is that as long as we cling to our ontological humanism, the line between human and non-human or human and animal itself licenses so-called inhuman behavior on the part of the powerful. And that's the truth that's embedded in the PETA campaign. So if humanist ontology is the theory, industrial and post-industrial capitalism is the practice. Um, as I'm sure you all know, we're increasingly quickly destroying our own planetary support system through a runaway capitalism that imagines natural resources and our own technological capacities to be infinite. Um, and yes, there are efforts to fix this within capitalism itself through practices like carbon taxes and other like, uh, events, uh, projects like the development of green energy that can help us adapt to and mitigate climate change. But overall, the commitment of the most powerful human groups on the planet to a humanist ontology and the capacity of capitalist practices to engulf almost all human activity seems to be leading to not only what Elizabeth Colbert has written about as the sixth great extinction among non-human species, but also our own extinction, or at least a transition crisis that only some of us will survive. And this notion is captured in the, the term of the Anthropocene. The idea that we're now living on a planet that's feeling the effects of unrestrained capitalism in every place and every level and dominated by this humanist ontology in which everything revolves around us. Everything in the world is placed for our um, benefit. And some intellectuals call the Anthropocene the capital scene. Um, so that's the essence of the critique. What might be the alternative? Um, well, as I'm sure you know, there have been a number of legal projects to try to bring non-human animals into the law as subjects, not as objects of care, as in animal welfare, but as in subjects in and for themselves. So for example, in 2013, the Non-Human Rights Project, led by the animal rights lawyer Stephen Wise, filed a habeas corpus suit in upstate New York on behalf of Tommy, a chimpanzee being held in captivity. And further back from that, in 1972, as the second wave of environmentalism was emerging in the US, Christopher Stone published an article in a USC Law Review called Should Trees Have Standing Toward Legal Rights for Natural Objects. So I think as lawyers, we already have technology for representing the interests of non-humans. In a way, passing new statutes, getting to court is the easier problem, even though it's difficult in and of itself. I think the harder problem is developing an ontology other than this liberal one, in which who and what gets represented depends either on its resemblance to us or its usefulness to us. And that's the process through which chimpanzees and orcas and baby seals get to be represented first. Snails and ants have to be at the back of the line. Uh, without an underlying cultural change that gets a robust minority of Western folks to value non-human entities not as others to be saved or tools for us, but as kin, then the best legal efforts will fail. Um, so I also teach critical race theory, and I've recently been teaching about um, post-colonial discourse and post-colonial practices. Um, and it occurred to me that there's a way in which um, some of the practices going on, projects going on right now that are post-colonial nature converge with the project of protecting non-human beings. Um, so one place to think about this is uh, last month in the, at, towards the end of February, indigenous leaders from around the world met at the United Nations to develop a new status for indigenous governments that would allow them to participate in the UN system as governments. Why are they currently not allowed to participate? Because only sovereign states are allowed to participate fully in the UN system and be considered the subjects of international law. Indigenous peoples are not defined under the UN system as states, but as peoples, this kind of ambiguous status. And why are indigenous peoples not considered to have governments? Because during the period of European colonialism, they were defined within the law of nations as lying outside the civilized world. Um, and the key legal move that conceptualized indigenous people in this way, as lacking the capacity to be the legal subjects of international law, was the doctrine of discovery. 
um, which you're probably familiar with from Johnson versus McIntosh um, in other cases as well. Under the doctrine of discovery, land occupied by heathens is technically terra nullius, empty land that is free for the taking by the European powers. Only Europeans can hold real property in fee simple. Native peoples can only have Indian title or possessory title. Um, Chief Justice John Marshall did not invent the doctrine of discovery, however. It was taken from the law of nations and incorporated into domestic law. And that international law of nations, in turn, emerged, emerged from canon law set forth by the pope. Not being Christian meant that you existed without law. And the doctrine of prescription, which presumes that if you possess a territory for a long time, you own it, did not apply to infidels. As a doctrine, um, the law of nation, of the law of nation, the doctrine of discovery aided the colonial project not just in the United States, but in European settler projects around the world, in Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, Spain, Portugal, and other places. It conveniently rationalized the subjugation of native peoples in the New World, Asia, and Africa, and it uh, wrote indigenous peoples out of the international legal system altogether. Um, now, how does this story intersect with the animal rights story? Um, so the um, Haudenosaunee, uh, Haudenosaunee people from is what now is the American Northeast. They're also known as the Iroquois. And they presented a conference paper to the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues whose intention is to undo the thinking that suggests that they were ever conquered. Uh, they call for the right to redress, restitution, or when that's not possible, a just, fair, and equitable compensation for the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned or otherwise occupied or used. Um, but the larger aim of this project, uh, according to Tanya Ganella Frischner, who before her early death in 2015 from breast cancer, founded the American Indian Law Alliance, is to save the earth. She wrote, quote, indigenous peoples are woven into the biological fabric of their traditional territories, which they are charged with a sacred responsibility to maintain for future generations. And there are indigenous peoples around the world who are prepared to once again take on this responsibility. Um, as you might know, in 2008, the Constitution of Ecuador granted rights to nature. And the origin of these rights is not the Anglo-American common law tradition, but the tradition of indigenous Amazonian people. In 2012, the New Zealand government recognized the rights of the Fanga Nui River, the Fanga Nui River Iwi, which is a, some, a group of people somewhat like a tribe, an indigenous community with a strong spiritual and cultural relationship with the river, have been advocating for legal recognition of the river since 1873. But now in 2012, the agreement recognizes the river as a single entity, Te Awa Tupua, with legal rights and interests and the owner of its own riverbed. And the Fanga Nui River Iwi are now recognized as joint custodians with the government entrusted to protect the river for present and future generations. Closer still, last October, uh, the state of Hawaii adopted a new code of practice and procedure for the Ahamoku Advisory Committee within the Department of Land and Natural Resources. And just to call out a few of the definitions uh, from the beginning of the code section, Ka Lewalani is a resource realm which the ancient Aha councils considered when making decisions. It encompasses everything above the air, the land, the air, the sky, the clouds, the birds, and the rainbows. Kanaka Haua, sorry for the pronunciation, is a resource realm which the ancient AHA councils considered when making decisions. It includes the natural resources important to sustain people. However, care for these resources are based on their intrinsic value. Management is based on providing for the benefit of the resources themselves rather than from the perspective of how these resources serve people. So what if those of us who care about animal rights and animal protection studied Indian law, not federal Indian law, but tribal law and the international law of indigenous peoples? And what if we together tried to build a coalition politics that seeks to give legal voice to human and non-human animals, but letting indigenous communities lead with a different ontology, one that is not derived from um, the Western Judeo-Christian uh, story that gives dominion of 
human beings over everything else on Earth. Thinking about animal protection as an anti-colonialist project and decolonization as an animal protection project is one path toward bringing together the political and legal projects of animal, animal protection, race, class, and gender. Um, so that's, those are some thoughts that I came up with in preparing for this talk. And I'm happy, excited to have a conversation with Kristen uh, and with you, who are more versed in animal rights uh, than I am. So thank you. Maybe I'll just ask you a few questions and then we'll turn, turn to the audience. But I think that um, the movie's lesson was really insightful. And so one takeaway from that that you brought us is that there's this critique of liberalism in which the other is, is always the other. And one way in which I, I think one of the, the implications of that is that we all then, all of us who are not part of the liberal elite that you've cr critiqued should then work together or somehow the similarities can be used in some liberatory Tory way. And yet we started, you started with the critique of the PETA advertisement, right, in the way that that was insensitive and more problematic and more putting off than it was inclusive. So I guess it really leads to the next question, which is how can these comparisons possibly be used in a productive way? Is there a way to, to you know, to, to be more blunt, to do a better job than the PETA analysis? Is there a way in which both, I mean, to, to draw upon the title of, of, of the talk, in which all marginalized groups, whether it's gender or race or species, can somehow work together or share the stories in a way that's not problematic? Um, and, that's, and that's what I meant when I talked yeah. about, when I gave the example of indigenous mm -hmm. people, that if we, if we go down deep to the roots of where some of these ideolo ideologies come from, mm -hmm. including the liberal story, then we can see how um, if we attack the, the deep roots, uh, we can create coalitions that are based not on this kind of inherently disrespectful notion of mm -hmm. we're the powerful and we're going to now pull you in and this liberal narrative of group after group slowly mm -hmm. gets included, but rather attacking the, uh, what I think is an anti-colonial, or uh, using an anti-colonial ideology to get at the roots both of the dominion of humans over animals and the dominion of some humans over other humans. Um, and so what I think is exciting about the turn towards indigenous rights is that a lot of indigenous folks uh, never came, never accepted, were never part of that initial story, but really come to um, the story with a very <coughs> different set of philosophical commitments. Um, there's, a, there's some really interesting work being done by a graduate student um, at Duke who is working on the Ecuador Constitution mm -hmm. and kind of exploring the origins of it. Um, and he talks about the philosophy of some of the Amazonian Indians whose ideology um, inspired the Constitution. Uh, and that's a culture in which people, um, or a set of cultures in which people sometimes turn into jaguars. Um, people commune with spirits. Um, people have in regular interactions with animals, but not in kind of the Western utilitarian way. So if we took that kind of mind, um, that kind of worldview, as a starting point and built out or interpreted the existing constitution from that perspective, rather from but than imposing our kind of Western narrative on the statutory language, I think we might come <coughs> out in very different places. So let me then follow up with that uh, with regards to the Non-Human Rights Project, which you mentioned, I think in a way as a potential model or in a, in a positive, a positive way. So, as you may know, or many of you may know, know in the class, the habeas claims on behalf of certain chimpanzees are of course premised on the fact that they have autonomy that looks very similar to, to humans, right? They're the highest in the chain of autonomy as Steve Weiss characterizes it. But when he's bringing these habeas claims, he has a f one fundamental problem, which is that animals are property. And habeas claims on the behalf of, of property is not something we're accustomed to. But if you look back, what's the example of a propertied entity upon for whom, you know, on whose behalf habeas claims have been brought slaves? And that forms an important part of his argument, one in which some judges have said, we don't really want to hear that. We don't want to hear more about that. 
what, how does that, how does that fit in? I guess, I guess I'm try, trying to get at, are any of these comparisons viable? Is there any middle space? Uh, or are we all moving towards the PETA example? Is there any way in which, we, granted the indigenous example you gave is, 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 is fantastic, but when someone harnesses it in a different way, is, are there possibilities there? Well, I really worry about that, um, mm -hmm. that comparison. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a comparison that, as you say, the logic drives us towards mm -hmm. because we're inside of this Anglo-American common law tradition, uh, which has embedded within it this ontological humanism that I've talked about. Mm -hmm. So there are good reasons for going there. But I, uh, again, I feel like it's not getting deep enough. It's not a radical mm -hmm. enough critique to really get us where we want to go in terms of a true partnership between the justice projects mm -hmm. for people of color and justice projects for non-human animals. It might work as a tactic mm -hmm. to kind of open up the courts. So I'm not saying, oh, the whole project is misguided from the start. But I think that we really need a deeper and more radical break from the liberal narrative in order to, to really transform our relationship with non-human animals mm -hmm. and transform our relationship with the planet um, in a way that I think is gonna be truly healthy. So to, then we get to the question of, well, how do you make change within social movements? Mm -hmm. And there, I'm very much a believer of, um, you know, inside and strategies and outside strategies. Mm -hmm. So maybe one way to think about the non-human rights project is that's an inside strategy. The post-colonial indigenous rights project is an outside strategy. And both of them together can maybe help push the movement along. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a purist in mm -hmm. suggesting that there's only one proper way to go. But I am suggesting that the Anglo-American sort of liberal common law rights path is one that inherently mm -hmm. takes us to this racist place of equating slaves with gorillas or orcas or other sorts of animals and doing this ranking in which the thing that we're trying to save or protect has to be like us mm -hmm. in some way in order for us to see its value, recognize its value. They, we've got to have this place of, well, it's a subject, it feels pain, it has consciousness, it thinks. We have to have these tests of cognition in order for folks to be persuaded. Mm -hmm. And that's the game that white people have been playing with people of color <coughs> forever, right? Are you, um, you know, are you smart enough? Mm -hmm. Is your civilization advanced enough? Um, are you really, you know, do you think in the right way? Do you have the right rule of law? Do you have the right kind of government? Uh, we're familiar with those sorts of tasks, and so it, the, I think that path only gets you so far. Mm -hmm. So in some ways I hear you saying the idea of, of, of a rights-based approach is, is not where you want to go, and I mean that maybe that's moving away from the, the article which, as we said, should people of color support animal rights, and you go on to have a, somewhat of a hopeful story at the end that the right kind of rights could be something that you, that you would say, yes, people, should, people of color should get behind. But I'm hearing you say something like, you really kind of want to dispense with the idea of a rights-based approach completely. And your approach is something else. It's based on some other kind of ethic. Um, I don't think I'm against rights, per se. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really like the, the both Bolivian and the Ecuadorian constitution mm -hmm. that grants rights to nature, mm -hmm. and there have been several attempts to create the so-called Earth jurisprudence in other countries as well, including the New Zealand example that I cited. Mm -hmm. So the problem isn't with rights as a structure. Um, as I suggested, I think that lawyers in, are actually the, doing the law, having the technology, which includes rights, includes practice of luring. That's in some ways the easy part, and it's a tool that can be used in many different ways. Mm -hmm. The question is what anchors mm -hmm. that technology and those tools. And are, is it going to be anchored by a philosophy of, is it like us, in which case we protect it, or is it not like us, in which case we don't, this kind of constant trying to judge status? Or is it going to be anchored in a different kind of philosophy mm -hmm. and ontology, which I think the New Zealand example, for example, and even the Hawaii example exemplify, uh, which is, say, it's a, the, the language on the page might be the same, 
but the practices, the understandings, the concepts, the philosophies that underlie those practices on the page or those words on the page and make them live is coming from a different place, a different set of traditions and customs. Um, so in that way, I'm kind of arguing for the importance of having social norms, understanding the social norms that are embedded in legal rights and legal practices and institutions, um, and paying attention to both parts. Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, to some extent then, is this more of an environmental ethic? Are, we more, is, are, are you drawing more upon tools of the environmental movement than the animal movement, per se, when you're proposing this alternative, um, the alternative approach? What does the environmental ethic appear in here? I guess I'm interested in indigenous approaches that kind of confuse the distinction that we would make between environment and animal environmental rights and animal rights. I mean, within the US tradition, for example, so we have a body of environmental law which views animals kind of in species terms as a resource or as part of a biosphere or part of an ecosystem that needs to be protected, and that's one body of law. And then we have this other body of law that sees animals either as individuals, members of a species, or in some cases as species themselves, but seeks to protect them for their own sake. Uh, what if we went to a, a, a philosophy or a body of law that confused the borders between those two and didn't think about, well, there's environment here and then there's animals over here, but thought of life as a web that includes animals and so-called non-human entities like rivers and like trees and uh, non-human animals as part of the same kind of uh, system. Um, so what I'm proposing is not to say we should look to environmental law per se, but again, to look to other traditions that maybe conceptualize the environment or animals and humans in a, in a completely different way. All right, so mindful of the time, I think it, we should take some questions from, from everyone who's gathered here. Chris, do you want to take care of the microphone? Thank you so much. This has been really interesting. I think that this idea of turning to indigenous knowledges seems uh, really productive in a way. Uh, but for me, it also provokes some anxieties about sort of white people with dream catchers and Lakota brand deodorant. And I, I wonder about the dangers of trying to kind of exploit indigenous knowledges as a source of kind of mainstream law and culture some of the risks there, and related to that, uh, I think there's also a, an obstacle to coalition there, at least in Canada, where I'm from, where uh, the animal rights movement is also a very white movement, has made some sort of clueless moves, particularly kind of going after First Nations practices like seal hunts. Uh, and so I wonder about the work that needs to be done to kind of build a foundation for a sharing that would have a sort of equal as opposed to exploitative dimension? I'm just interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And that's, you know, I think that's the perfect question to kind of follow up from, from what I'm trying to talk about because, again, I think you're very right that um, as long as, for example, uh, white folks hold the power and indigenous folks don't, and white people are saying, oh, let's, let's mine some great ideas from those people. It looks like they have some ideas. Let's use them. Um, then yeah, you're just going to replicate the same kind of power dynamic. You're not really changing the story at all. It really has to be a coalition in which indigenous folks lead. And that's going to be really difficult. It's a political project. Um, you also see this in the US environmental movement where I Don't Know More and other indigenous groups are trying to fight against resource extraction. Um, and the indigenous folks are saying, hey, it's time for us to take the lead. It's not about you and us helping you out in your project. It's about us and how you can help us. And changing the dynamics of that power relationship is going to be really hard with the history of exploitation and domination that we have. So I'm not saying it's, it's an easy path at all. But I think that it's a just path. I think that it's a path that is more likely to create justice both for human groups and for non-humans than the existing kind of we've got the power, we've got the will to power, and now we're going to use it in whatever way we, we think is going to be efficacious.
Oh, I can fill down here. My name is Kanchi Gandhi. I am from Department of Biology. You spoke very well. Your talk flew just like a fountain. I, it was a pressure to listen to your talk. Uh, in the, I am against any animal killing, including even small insects. But as a biologist, sometimes there is a line. For example, in the nearby town called Kankar, the deer population exploded. And at the same time, the plant diversity is declining because the deer population, you know, they have to graze on something. And even what we consider as what you call endangered or rare species, those species, those plants are disappearing. So in biologist perspective, it is, as a vegetarian, yes, I'm against killing. But as a biologist, you are concerned about what you call the, the diversity. And recently, just two weeks ago, I returned from India. I traveled to many major cities giving botanical talks. In all big cities, it is very difficult to walk in the late in the night time because there are a number of stray dogs and they will be threatening you. So again, killing stray dogs is against my consciousness, but at one time, nearly about 20 stray dogs attacked a four-year-old and killed him. So no, sometimes it's a very thin line to walk between animal cruelty and plant diversity and human safety. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great question. I'm going to throw it at Kristen because <laughs> um, I think that's, that's a classic kind of, uh, of, those are great examples of the classic tension between kind of the environmentalist perspective and then um, the kind of anti-killing or the reverence for life or reverence for animal perspective. And it's a, it's a question I know biologists all over the world are struggling with. How do you you know, from the individual level, at the individual level, you don't want to kill. But at the species level or the ecosystem level, you see this destruction that's going to happen unless there's some kind of intervention. And it's kind of the, the inevitable fruit of a world in which humans, like it or not, have taken over and we're living in this Anthropocene. And then what, what are the ethical choices that we make? Um, so do you have? Well, I would just add to that that you know, these are the kinds of questions that I was thinking of you know, with your suggestion of returning to the you know, indigenous people's approaches is that I think people in the animal protection movement might feel a little nervous about that because in some ways are we just recreating these exact same questions, right? Kind of putting it all in together in which cases individual animals often lose to species, uh, species-based considerations and then they often lose to human, to human interests. So I don't know that we ever get away from these kinds of questions no matter what framework we're operating in. They just are very fundamental. I think in some ways the, the kind of the politics of um, group dynamics within justice-based movements, again, it's one of these questions that you can never fully escape because they're going to be conflicts um, and they're going to be different ways of framing the project. So I think it's kind of endemic to justice movements to have those sorts of, of competitions and those sorts of conflicts and, and tensions. Um, but within, but I would also argue that that's inevitable, that there's not a way to do justice projects without grappling with that because the fact is as the animal rights and anti-colonial critique 
suggest, um, these movements are all intertwined because often they're working off of the same logic of subordination. And um, the CRT idea of intersectionality tells us that these struggles are all entangled. And so there's no way that we can hide some of them off and treat them as self-contained anyway. So it just becomes a question of politics and how you do that politics. And the aim is to be uh, to find those points of coalition that most further the ambitions of the groups that are trying to work together. And I've argued that kind of the, the PETA example of trying to form coalition between people of color and animals doesn't work, but there is a deeper version of that that I think works better. One more question, and I'll stop. Um, my question is about you, you said I describe myself as like a critical race theory feminist who's also interested in animal um, welfare, like part of that. I'm just wondering what your what the reception is among like other people in your discipline for like your particular animal interest, or if that like you feel like that's like, very consistent for like, more out there, and um, how you like describe that. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I definitely feel like I'm, I'm a little bit out there in the critical race feminist world because I think a, a lot of folks who are working within CRT reflexively have the same, a version of the same liberal narrative that, you know, animals are less important than humans and so we should fix the human problem first and then after that's fixed and we have justice, then we'll think about animals. Um, but and what I try to do with them is the same version of what I try to do in, in the reverse conversation when I'm talking to animal rights groups. Um, I try to do the same thing with CRT folks and try to unpack the ways in which these are not sequential struggles. They are part of the same struggle. And to the extent that we can, we should address them together. So that's the sense in which I think reframing animal protection as an anti-colonial movement maybe makes sense to people in the critical race theory world because once they see, oh, this is not just about 
protecting orcas. This is about a whole different worldview that tries to go back to the doctrine of discovery and realize why that was wrong and to give back indigenous lands. Then they start to get the, the intellectual projects. So in that sense, I kind of see myself as the go-between, trying to bring together the CRT world that's been very focused on humans, um, in the animal rights world that's very focused on animals and say, hey, you know, there's a lot of common ground here. There are ways in which our projects converge and that we can work together more effectively than we can separately. So, thanks. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.